dear beloved, welcome back. We have made it, friends, to part three in our Find Your People book study uh, series. It has been so good walking through this book with you guys. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I truly have enjoyed diving into this topic uh, the past couple months, so it's just been so good for me. Um, these types of episodes are so fun for me because I'm... I love to learn, I love to study, um, and so nerding out on books is like my happy place. So if you like these episodes and you want to see more, please let me know. Uh, DM me or leave me a review on the podcast either is greatly appreciated, um, and let me know your feedback too. Today we are wrapping up Find Your People by Jenny Allen with part three of her book. Um, in the last three chapters, she goes through finding your family, holding on to your family, and intimacy of the few. So let's just dive in with finding your family. Her chapter on finding your family talks about the definition of families and how it's changed a bit. While it's true that we can't choose our biological family, she says that you do have some say in who you are close enough to call family. Um, and so there may be moments in your life or, uh, you know, that you've been cared for by a different family than your biological family. Um, and even though they're different, they have welcomed you with open arms into their family and you've really felt like family. She talks a lot uh, she talks about a lot of these types of experiences um, in this chapter to demonstrate how you can really choose or be chosen by those you who you call family. Um, it's the idea of taking care of one another, no matter who you are, and she says that that's the thing that we crave the most. Um, the original design of God for the family is the best community. And I love that she says that because it's very true, um, but also it's not often that you hear people saying that, right? Um, so again, she's saying that the original design of God for the family is the best community. He designed us to be there for each other, um, shower each other with love and affection, hold on to each other, um, hold each other's hands when times are tough, be able to talk things through with each other, navigate troubled waters together, um, even when the trouble is at home, right? Even when there's conflict in the family, we are, are made to really take that head on and protect the relationship of the family however that would look. So essentially that means, you know, coming through the conflict together and better on the other side. Um, he designs us to come alongside each other in this thing we call life. And sometimes that's the, you know, the joy of life. Sometimes that's also where we find the most heartache and the most hurt in the people who are closest to us. And she constantly is saying that in this book, which is such a good reminder for us. And she says on page 190, she says that family was supposed to be our first community, a gathering of people who accepted and loved us and then taught us to accept and love others well. This was God's original plan, both to bless people within families and then to bless through families the rest of the world. Yes, I love that so much. Um, and it's really only through a close walk with God that you can come to know that, right? Um, to come to know that truth and, and an experience of family that really calls forth um, the truth of our design and the truth of the love of the Father. Because if we were only exposed to terrible <laughs> experiences and to terrible examples of this, we would never come to the realization of, why we were created in a family. And so it's important that God himself is a community um, to show us these truths when we can't see it experientially. Um, but thankfully enough that that experiential 
possibility is and should be the experience of most people. And so it's a beautiful thing that we can strive towards um, even in our families, even if we're broken to to fix and heal those relationships so that we can experience those good things in our family now and also in, you know, every moment moving forward as our families continue to grow. However, um, she always brings us back here. Uh, however, we as broken as sinful people have screwed up in that relationship, right? And sometimes it's so bad that um, we're not taking care of our families anymore. We're not really taking care of each other. Um, and so maintaining a strong, close family relationship is really hard. It takes a lot of work and some don't succeed. But those who do are stronger for it, right? It's that, that, um, that you know, tension point. Um, and she says in the book, she says, we love others in the manner in which we ourselves were loved. Equally true, we tend to hurt others in the manner in which we ourselves have been hurt. The cycle perpetuates itself until something interrupts it and someone says enough. And she was talking about that in, in relation to um, a story she was telling with her and her father. And I think it, it's a beautiful and true representation of you know, what we take in is what we then turn around and give. Um, and so it's all the more important to focus on where are we getting um, this love or this hurt. And if it's in our families um, and it's supportive, lean into that. And also lean into the relationship that you have with God himself because he's perfect love, right? And if in your family it, it's a lot of hurt and not so much of the love, then, you know, don't just leave them there. Try to reconcile, but also find your strength in the love of the Lord. Because otherwise, like she says, the, perpetu the cycle will perpetuate itself and you will turn around and hurt others whether or not that's your intention. So we want to make sure that we're getting... Um, filled up in in the the way of love uh, so that we can then turn around and give love to others um, then she turns focus and, and starts talking about choosing to stay right so when times do get hard there needs to be a choice to stay and to fight um, for your relationship whether it's friendship or in the family um, it's hard it's costly. It can cost you a lot personally with your time, um, resources, peace of mind, <laughs> etc. It can cost a lot of things, but you'll be better for it uh, in the long run. And in the book, she lists out a bunch of things that happen when you choose to stay. It's definitely worth reading. So if you haven't gotten the book yet, definitely do. I mean, I've said that a million times, <laughs> but um I do love that, that list that she puts in there, um, just kind of about like forgiving people and, and really accepting them for who they are. Because when we choose to stay, we choose to love somebody, we're choosing all of them, right? We're not choosing only this part of them that's good. We're choosing them and we're saying, you are worthy of a relationship with me and I'm going to do my utmost to ensure that I... Um, and the best person in that relationship for you. And so by choosing that, you're accepting them as they are and not who you wish them to be in the future. Things like that that are really helpful to um, think about and to read and to go over. And then she talks about holding on to your people, right? Because the truth is, is that the enemy is working in conflict in the rifts that create that are created um, in the family and in relationships, right? He wants us to quit each other. Um, he wants us to walk away. And the antidote to that, which you might be able to guess, is God, right? She says relationships always go wrong when God's not at the center. And that's so true. I mean, just think back to any experience in your life when God is no longer the center of your relationship, whether it be your relationship with yourself or your relationship with somebody else, uh, it starts to crumble, right? Um, 
And in this chapter, she mentions a couple of traps that we can walk into that can cost us our family and our friends. So she talks about these um, in more detail, but I'm just kind of going to kind of list them here. She, she says the trap of codependency, um, the trap of independence. We spoke about this one in on the, epi the first episode that we did on the book, right on the first part. And she adds here, and I want to read this quote from her. She says, at your very core, God built us to be fragile, finite, needy creatures so that we could come to him and so we would lean into the strengths and gifts of one another. If there is one principle that has shaped my last three years of ministry, it is this. Pull people in at every turn. Never do anything alone. Why? Because even God exists in community within himself. That is beautiful. That is so beautiful and it is so true. Um, we are built to, to, to depend on each other. We are not built to do this world alone, right? And, and we hear that all the time, right? We hear we're made for community. It is not good for man to be alone. But what does the, how does that look practically? Like how can, like, what does that mean, right? What does that mean to live in community? And a lot of times that means depending on one another. Like she said earlier in the book, um, I don't know if you remember, but one of the issues that she had with one of her friends was that her friend said, listen, you don't need me ever. And I think that that is a big, you know, moment of, ooh, like I, I needed to depend on people because they're not seeing, they're not feeling um, needed. And that's something that we all need, right? We need to feel needed um, and loved and a part of these relationships. So we want to make sure that we are really leaning into our dependency um, on God and on the people around us because he put us there next to each other for a reason um, and for many, many reasons. But uh, the one thing that we can do practically is start leaning in, leaning into those around us, leaning into God. Um, and, and like she says in that quote, pull people in at every step, pull people in, right? Um, to go on with the list of the traps, she says the trap of busyness, that's a big one for sure. We come up with all these excuses, I'm busy, I can't make friends, I can't, uh, you know, give time to my community because I have XYZ things I need to do and we fill our lives with a lot of times emptiness um, and we need to say no, <laughs> we need to say stop and we need to say, hey, listen, I need community and my community needs me. Um, another trap is that of gossip. And she says in here, she says, you know, have you ever left uh, a meeting of friends and you feel worse than when you got there? And she says that that's probably because you were gossiping, <laughs> right? You spent the whole time instead of connecting with one another, you were gossiping about other people and tearing people down. And that's never, you know, it's never going to make you feel good. Um, another trap is that of comparison. Ooh. We all struggle with this one, right? <laughs> the trap of comparison, comparing um, ourselves to our friends, comparing ourselves to other people we don't even know. That's become very prevalent with um, the rise of social media and things like that, that we can compare ourselves uh, to people who we've never met and will never meet. Um, the trap of laziness, right? Of just being like, well, you know, I could go out and make new friends, <laughs> or I could sit here, right? Um, or the trap of fear. We're afraid of stepping out. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of X, Y, Z. We're afraid of all these things, right? Um, and intimacy, as she has said many times, is worth fighting for. And it takes work, right? She, she says that over and over and over again. Intimacy takes work. And it's so true. Um, and when she talks about intimacy, she talks about, here in this last chapter, she talks about intimacy of the few, right? We need people who are in it with us, right? Walking life with us, like, for example, our spouse, um, our best friends, etc. Or if we're already married, our spouse is, you know, our, our couple friends, right? We need people who are walking this life with us. 
Um, and I love that she says, you and I don't need 50 people to know our hard, but we need a few who are in it with us. And that's so true. I think sometimes um, we might think that we would feel better if a bunch of people who knew us slightly knew what we were going through because in some way they would pity us and maybe that's what we're looking for. But in reality, what we really want is not the pity of many, but we want the understanding and the comfort of some who really understand you and understand what you're going through. A lot of times when we're looking for pity, it always falls short, right? Because people don't who aren't close enough to us won't know the full gravity of what you're going through. And so their response can never be equal to the hurt or the heavy or the joyful things you're going through. It can never equate because they don't know. <laughs> they don't know you. They don't know what you're going through. And so finding those people who do know everything and leaning into them, especially in the hard and in the joyful, that's when we'll feel most connected because we'll f we'll get that response that not only we're craving, but that is appropriate for whatever we're sharing, right? And she ends this book with a prayer for true community. And she says, without God helping us find our people and keeping them, the challenge of finding and keeping our people feels too daunting. So if you'd like to read that prayer uh, and pray the prayer, uh, go to the end of the book. She has that there for you. Um, I've taken a lot from this book for the past few months, and I hope and pray that it's blessed you as well. Um, I want to thank you for coming on this journey with me <laughs> on uh, these last three episodes talking about this book. Um, if you want to see more episodes like this, like I said, let me know um, and give me suggestions on which books and which authors and, you know, different things that we can go through together. Until next time.